Great. So the next thing I want to show you is how you can set up a pipeline to actually dynamically pull geometry uh, from Rhino into Grasshopper. So instead of sort of always telling it which geometry you want to reference, you can set up pipelines to take any geometry according to certain rules and analyze it within Grasshopper. So for now, I'm going to hide my reference to the exterior surface, and I'm going to start to work on these inter interior volumes. So my concept here is that I just have these volumes, and each one is a space. So one thing I might want to do is bring all of these volumes in and calculate um, the floor area of these volumes. Okay. So I'll start uh, the same way. I'll bring in the geometry node. And here, since I have several objects, and geometry is like the most general node. So if you're wondering why I'm not using something more specific like surface or box, um, those are more specific. And sometimes it's useful to use them. But if you're just bringing in stuff from Rhino, you can bring everything into the geometry node and then let uh, you know, as long as you're precise about what you're doing, then you won't have any problems. So I, I tend to, when I'm bringing stuff in, just bring everything into a geometry node. Okay, so you can right click on this again. Uh, now, since we have multiple, we can go to set multiple geometries and just start selecting the objects in the scene. And then when you're done, you hit enter. So now uh, it's referenced all, uh, how many is here? Six boxes. And if you hover over the geometry node, you see now it says six locally defined values and it has and lists each one. Whereas here there was one, now there's six. And um, in Grasshopper, most any node can actually hold multiple amounts of geometry. Okay, so in here we have one. Here it's a list of uh, surfaces and we can act on that list all at the same time. So once you start doing this, you get into more complex situations of how Grasshopper deals with lists of things. And we're going to go over some of those specific situations kind of as we get to them. Um, but data handling Grasshopper might, can start to become complex as you work with different data structures. So right now it's pretty simple. We just have a list of six objects. But potentially it can get more complicated. And we'll just get uh, to that later. Okay, so now I have these boxes. And I'm going to set up a very quick way to just get the floor area of each box. There's many ways to do uh, anything. You just have to think about like how you would do in, in Rhino and then uh, kind of reverse engineer it through the, these uh, nodes in Grasshopper. So for instance, in this case, uh, I have these boxes. And one way to get floor area is to cut each box at a certain level and then take the area of that intersection. So we have this kind of idea of what we want to do, and then we just go step by step and do all those things uh, within Grasshopper. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, figure out what the lowest point of each box is, so then I know where to cut the box. Okay? So one way to do that is I'll create a point at the origin. I'll just hide all this stuff for now. So you can see, this is all my Grasshopper geometry. So I'm going to create a point at the origin. Um, just by double clicking, creating a point node, and then going to set one point, and just hit it, typing in zero in Rhino. So that will create a reference to the origin in Rhino. And you can see the preview of that point here. Okay, so now I have this point, and I'm going to uh, have Grasshopper tell me the closest point to this origin point on every box. And this will give me one of the lowest points of the box. OK, so here I'm going to type in um, closest, start typing closest. And one of the options here is BREP closest point. And when you hover over any of these nodes, it gives you a short description of what that node does. So here it says, find the closest point on a BREP. It sounds like what we want. Place that on the canvas. See, you can see here there's two inputs. There's the point input and your uh, B rep, your surface. So we'll pass the surface into the B and the point into the point. OK, so now we don't want to take a section at the bottom of the box. We actually want to move it up a bit, right? Um, so we'll take 
we'll use this point to generate a section that's four feet up from the ground, which is like the typical place where a plan gets cut uh, in architecture. So what we'll do now is um, this VREP closest point, it has two outputs, it has points. So these are, uh, if we hide these, these are the actual closest points. And these are the distance of those points from that origin. So we don't really need the distance, but we're gonna work with these points uh, to generate those sections. So the first thing I'm, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take each of these six points and move it up four feet. And the move is a transformation that you can get uh, in the transformation tab. And you can see there's a ton of ways to transform uh, and translate in geometry. One thing you won't see in these options is a copy command. Because like I was saying before, anytime you pass data or geometry among these nodes, it just inherently copies it. So if you want to copy something, you just move it. And you have both the original and the final moved version. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to use the move node to move each of these points up four feet. So he, the geometry, uh, it's asking for the geometry to move and a translation vector. So the vector describes the motion um, that you want. So that our geometry will be the points. We plug those in here. And for the translation vector, you can see that um, there's a default in here. So right now it's, it's pretty happy, it's white. Um, there's no warnings. Uh, and that's because even though we haven't connected anything to the vector, and that's because there's a default built in here. So by default, you can see it's gonna move it zero, zero, 10. So zero in the X direction, zero in the Y direction, and 10 up. And you can see now our copies of our points, 10 units up. Okay, so that's great if we want to move it 10 units up, but we want to move it four units up, so we want to control that vector. Um, the easiest way to make a vector in Grasshopper is to use a unit vector. So if you double click, a lot of the vector options are under the vector tab here. There's point options and vectors, so you can look into these. Uh, there's a lot of useful things. Um, I'm just gonna use a unit Z vector, so I can type in unit after double clicking, and I have this unit X, Y, Z vectors. I'll click on the unit Z, and this will give me a, a vector that's going in the Z direction, one unit. So if I plug this in, to the translation vector, you can see that now it's moving up one unit. But each of these unit vectors also has a, a factor built in where I can tell it how big that vector is. And this is how I can control the height where things are extruding. Um, so an easy way to bring in uh, number inputs into Grasshopper is with a slider. A slider, if you go to parameters, inputs, there's all these different ways to bring inputs into Grasshopper. You can see the number slider is one of them and the panel is another. So one way is to just use a panel. This is like the second use of panels. You can just double click in the panel. Uh, if nothing's connected to it, you can use it as an input. And here you can just type in any value. So you can do two. And then you can just connect that into here. And as you change this, you see that that value gets changed. Now we're telling the Z vector to be magnitude five and we're passing on to translation. This is great if you have like kind of constant values. If you want to actually change things dynamically, you can use a slider. So the slider you can get from your input menu. By default, it'll create a slider where you can change the value from zero to one. Uh, a fast shortcut, if you know the value that you want, but you want the slider to kind of start off but have a range, um, you can double click on your, uh, on your canvas and you can type in any value. And you can see it'll automatically create a number slider where the value will be 10. If I hit enter here, it's created a slider from zero to 10. And since I typed in an integer, it'll give me an integer slider. You can see here it's kind of changing in whole numbers. If I double click and I give it a decimal point, so I say 10.0, it'll give me a slider with one significant digit. And you can do this with any number of significant digits create more smooth transitions. All right. So now I have the slider that's going from zero to 10. I'm gonna plug it in to my unit Z vector. You see that now I can adjust how much that's moving. Pretty basic, right? But that's how that works. 
So now if I double click, I can change this to four, and I have these points moving up four units. Okay, so now I have those points. I can use those points as my reference for where to take the sections of the boxes. So to make that section, I am going to use this uh, intersect panel, just to the left of transform. This panel has a lot of tools like booleans and intersections that you will find in Rhino. Um, and in here is an option to do an intersection with a B rep and a plane. That's what we want to do. We have these B reps, right? These surfaces, these boxes, and we want to intersect them with a plane that's defined by one of these points. So I'm going to click on this uh, node and drop it into my uh, canvas. And this is asking for a series of B reps and a series of planes. So the B reps, I'm going to use my original geometry. And for the points, I'm going to use, or for the planes, I'm going to use these points. So by default, if you pass points into something that's looking for a plane, it's going to assume that what you mean is you want x, y planes at each of those points. Okay, so it's kind of a shortcut. I can also create a plane at each of those points and pass it, but I can also plug these directly in. All right, so you can see what happened here. If I turn this back on, what's happened is that I took each of these boxes and intersected it with each of these points and created these outlines in my floors. And this works because I'm passing it the same number of both things. So if you go to your um, uh, B rep plane section tool, hover over the inputs, you see I'm passing it six surfaces and I'm giving it six planes. All right? So what Rhino, what Grasshopper will do is actually go one to one. It'll take the first box and the first point and do the intersection. The second box, the second point, and do the intersection. If I was to pass uh, a different number of both things, it has specific ways that it handles that condition. So if you pass it one uh, surface and six points, it's going to create six separate intersections of that one box. And you can explore this on your own, but this is where it gets a little bit um, tricky is you have to know exactly um, how the data is being handled. In this case, because we have one uh, same number of each, uh, it's pretty easy. Okay, so we have these sections now. So what we have is uh, basically six curves. And now we can take the area of each curve to figure out the total floor area in these boxes. Uh, so to do the area, again, we use the same area component. And this works on curves as well as uh, surfaces. We pass these curves into the geometry tab. And in here, uh, we have all of those uh, areas. So what you might notice is that this preview, this uh, output is getting a little bit more complicated. There's these indices on the left, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2. You also might notice that the wire has changed to a dashed line. Uh, and I'm not going to talk too much about why this is happening. Basically, the, the type of line denotes the type of data that's being passed. Uh, here we had single lines, so when we have one data point, so we have one surface, one point, we have one piece of data, it's a single thin line. If we have multiple pieces of data, but they're all in the same level, like this is just a straight list of six surfaces, it's a fat line. But then as soon as you start to perform operations on complex data types, Grasshopper will basically store the information of that structure. So if you, in here we passed it uh, six uh, surfaces, and we did one operation on each surface, Grasshopper will start to organize that in this kind of data tree. So we have now one data entry for each surface, and we have one intersection uh, for each operation. So here, as panel comes in handy to see what's going on, we create a panel and connect that output. You can see how now there's the same number of data, right? There's just six things, but those six things are now grouped into these uh, branches in the tree. Okay, so once we pass that geometry, there's six curves. We're gonna get six areas. So if we bring back one of these panels, we can see that we have 
uh, six of these areas. We have an area for each floor. Now we can sum them all up to get our total floor area. So there's a component called uh, mass addition. This will take a stream of data and uh, add everything together. So in this case, because we have this tree structure, it's only adding up things within the branch. So before we can add all the data together, we need to actually flatten that tree structure. Um, so to flatten the tree, you can go to uh, under sets. There's this tree operations, and you can explore these on your own, like all the different ways that tree is basically this data structure type that Grasshopper uses. And the most basic one is flatten tree. So this will take any complex uh, tree structure and it'll flatten everything out. So you see here we had this complicated kind of group structure and out comes just our six data points in order. And if we pass this in here now, then it does what we want. Basically pass it six numbers and this adds them all together. And in the newer versions of Rhino, uh, they've actually built in the flattening components into the inputs. So if you click on, if you right click on any of the inputs, uh, there's these different operations and one of them is flattened. So this will actually flatten anything that's coming into that input. So now if we pass the areas into our input, and they get flattened and we get the same result. So it's just a shortcut. Okay, so I know that was really quick. Uh, hopefully you could just follow along and kind of make this work. A lot of the ways you learn grasshoppers is just from doing things and kind of troubleshooting along the way, especially with data structures. I just want to explain a little bit about how the data structures become more and more complex as we're doing different operations.